Order members, the sitting is resumed and it's time now for questions to the Minister for Education and I call it Sandra Overend. Thank you. Question number one, please. As the Assembly is aware, I bid in June monitoring for nearly £50 million of inescapable pressures and receive £5 million. The bulk of these pressures relate to services such as special education and school maintenance, which are provided to schools by the Education and Library Boards. I did not receive any allocations from the October monitoring round, hence I have to manage these pressures internally. I am on record as stating that the ALBs are currently operating at the extremities of corporate risk, which is why the establishment of the new Education Authority next year is vital. All five Education and Library Boards have submitted their 2014-15 initial resource allocation plans, and all of these have been approved by the Department. I believe that the five ELBs do have the required level of resources to fulfil the remit during 14-15. However, as I have already stated, we face significant internal pressures and will be very challenging to deliver a balanced education budget for this financial year. Nevertheless, that is my aim, and I believe to date I have demonstrated a clear commitment to prudent budget management while maximising the use of the finite resources available to me. I call Sandra Overham. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I the, the five education library boards have been effectively run down for months, if not years. Could the minister confirm whether or not any of the five current education library boards are projecting a financial deficit for the 2014-2015 financial year? And will the new single educa education authority be saddled with historic de debt at its inception? <coughs> well, uh, as I said, the current spending plans by the boards have been accepted and agreed by my department. We wouldn't have accepted and agreed any plans which would have seen a significant overspend or planned overspend by any of the boards. But we're still uh, well, significantly into this financial year. There may be unforeseen prices bear down on the boards or other prices come to light on the boards, particularly in relation to special education needs, which place greater pressure on their budget management. I will work with the boards to the best of my ability and financial resources to ensure that where real prices are identified, we can support them. But at this stage, I'm not aware of any board which will overspend at this stage. I call Pat Sheehan. Uh, thank the Minister for his answers. Uh, and I wonder, could the Minister please outline what steps have been taken to ensure smooth transition from five education and library boards into one authority by April uh, 2015? A business plan has been submitted uh, in relation to the, the workings on transition between the five education library boards and the new authority, um, obviously depending on the final outcomes and workings of the education bill and the final shape uh, and size of the authority and roles of that authority, though I have urged members to keep their amendments few and far between as we are working on a compromise bill and it's, it's, it's vitally important that the principles of the bill are not uh, detracted from if we are to seek agreement on the way forward. But we are progressing in terms of tra transition between the five boards and the new authority I, and I do expect them to, the authority to be inheriting any major or significant deficits from the five education and library boards. We have been preparing for ESA over this last number of years. The boards in terms of staffing have been uh, running uh, at times heroically in terms of the number of staff they have to deliver their services. So there has been staff reductions in place in preparation for a single authority. I'll say it was ESA, but we're now moving towards the, the education authority. So there has been a significant degree of preparation already taking place to allow us to move forward towards a single authority. I call Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his answers thus far. Minister, in the first year of operation of the new education authority, it's important that it works effectively. What budget has been set aside both for the establishment and for the operation of the new education authority in its first year? I, as the member will be aware, the executive only agreed its draft budget last week. It was presented to the Assembly on Monday. I will be working with my officials over the coming days and weeks to prepare a budget for the Education Department 15-16. As part of that budget, obviously the Education Authority will play a significant factor in how we fund the Education Authority moving forward. But while welcoming the fact that Education did receive significant protection uh, in the 15-16 budget, we do have to deal with significant uh, reduction in resources of somewhere in the region of £94 million. 
and that will have an impact on my planning for the Education Authority as well. I had admitted to advise members that question number 12 has been withdrawn. I now call Brenda Hill. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question 2, please. Uh, thank you, Member. Information provided by the General Teaching Council shows that from the 1st of April 13 to the 31st of March 14, there were 598 local graduates, of whom 466 are currently registered with the Council. 417 of those registered have not found a permanent teaching post here. However, 106 of those teachers have found significant temporary work of one term or more. 49 of those registered have permanent teaching posts. However, figures from the Council show that at January 2014, 67% of registered teachers who graduated here in 2009 have secured employment of a permanent or significant temporary nature. I recognise that this is a very difficult time for teachers and particularly for those who are newly qualified. The education budget continues to face significant pressures and this has necessitated cost-based redundancies in teaching staff over the past four years across our schools. As this continues, I suspect that will impact on the teaching workforce in our schools. I will, however, continue to push the, educa push the education budget at the executive table. I call Brenda Hale for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his um, detailed answer. And could the Minister explain why he is capping pupil numbers in areas where showing a large rise in population growth? And is this not exacerbating the problem for newly qualified teachers trying to find employment opportunities? No, um, because what I would be doing is concentrating all pupils in one area and taking them from another area, which means that you, you have the same amount of pupils and you require the same amount of teachers. And in fact, if you concentrate them all in the one school, you might require even less teachers. So uh, I, I know what the member is hinting at, uh, in fairness to her, uh, but I, this is not the answer to that question. I call Dominic Bradley. But while I'm saying free dinara and Mitcha Sasta scheme fosti acta kid vlena to wunchori nu a kailiha, femera taako and alban a horchistach and shaw. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And could I ask the, the Minister if he would be prepared to consider uh, a, an employment scheme for first year newly qualified teachers such as is, exists in Scotland? Uh, thank the member for his question. We have considered uh, the scheme which was outlined in Scotland, and there was quite significant costs which would have fallen upon my department and the executive or who would have followed through with that scheme. Um, and we simply do not have the resources to bring that to fruition. We have brought in a similar scheme, though not to the scale of numbers that perhaps everyone in the House would like, but under the Deliver Delivering Social Change programme. We have brought newly qualified teachers into the workforce in relation to numeracy and literacy uh, projects within our schools, which are paying great dividends to pupils and to those newly qualified teachers. But the scale of cost involved in the, the outlining of the Scottish scheme is just unachievable given the current budgets and block grant delivered to us by the Westminster Government. Moving on, I call David McNary. Question number three. My mission statement for all post-primary schools is already clear and is set out in my department's school improvement policy, every school a good school. The member needs to be aware that all post-primary schools are required to deliver the same revised curriculum. The member also needs to be aware that the legislative definition of a grammar school has no relationship with the curriculum or even with so-called academic selection. I call David McNary for supplementary. I do thank the Minister for his... Uh answer and um, making me aware of certain things which I, I can assure him I am aware of. In, in light of his answer, would, would he, and uh, I'm going to probably press him, Deputy Speaker, would he agree to develop a technically based vocational curriculum in our secondary schools dovetailed into vocational education post-16 and apprenticeships? The members original question and a second question come from a flawed position where he believes that in some way grammar schools teach a different curriculum than non-grammar schools. All our schools now have to match up to the entitlement framework. They have to offer a wide breadth of subjects to study to their young people. 
and these cover the wide areas commonly referred to as academic and vocational. So, what the member urges me to do is already in place, but it's already in place for all post-primary schools, regardless of the nameplate on the front gate. I call Mickey Brady. I got the last concordia. I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Could I ask the Minister to outline how uh, non grammar post primaries have performed in recent years? Um, in the 2013 year, 39.2% uh, of school leavers in the non grammar sector achieved five or more GCSEs at grades A to C star, or A star to C, or equivalent, including English, maths, compared to 94.8% of the leavers in grammar school. In 2013, 15.5% of school leavers in the non-grammar sector achieved three or more A-levels at grades A, C to star equivalent compared to 65.1% of leavers in the grammar sector. International evidence and our own analysis points to the fact that concentrating deprivation in particular schools compounds the negative impact that deprivation has on pupil outcomes. In our post-primary sector, this concentration of deprivation is most evident in non-selective schools. And we are aware of the particular challenges those face the schools. But it's also worth noting that uh, achievement in our non grammar sector, and I use the term advisedly, is, continues to grow despite the challenges that are placed on it by the system being largely weighted against them in terms of the continued use of alleged academic selection. Moving on, I call Robin Swan. Question number four. <coughs> I recognise the importance of continued, continuing professional development, uh, CPD for teachers and school principals in raising standards and improving educational outcomes for our young people. CPD is most, mostly delivered by the Curriculum Advisory and Support Service and the Regional Training Unit, RTEU, which my department funds. In each education and labour board, CAS provide advisory and support services to schools in this area. Therefore, they are the main providers of in-service training. In order to identify training needs, CAS carry out an annual training needs audit of schools from which they prepare a scheme of support. It is therefore a matter for schools to prioritise the training they require. The professional development requirements of individual teachers can be established by school leaders through the annual performance review and staff development scheme. CPD for school leaders is provided by the RTU, the Regional Training Unit. This includes leadership and management support for emergent and aspiring leaders, as well as serving principals. RTE provides a range of programmes based on good practice and research. In addition, the Department also directly funds other educational partners to provide CPD in specific areas, including special educational needs, STEM and Irish medium education. The officials are working on a strategy for teacher education and are engaging with key stakeholders to get a consensus on the way forward. This will result in a new strategy for the teacher professional development to be launched next year. I call Robin Swan. I thank the Minister very much. I am sure the Minister is aware that in the joint DE Dell review uh, of teacher training, the international panel member, Professor Gordon Kirk, actually said there was a discontinuity between initial teacher training and CPD and there was need for huge investment. I'm aware now the minister has just answered that he's bringing forward a strategy. Has he also any funding to put behind that strategy, so that there's a common approach by the department rather than leaving it up to individual board of governors or principals as to the CPD of individual teachers? Uh, I, I'm personally delighted that so many members today are concentrating on the financial needs of my department, as we are at the start of an eight-week consultation into the draft budget, and I have no doubt that members who are rising in their seats today will be fully supportive of me when I, I uh, lobby my executive colleagues for more money for the education budget, as they no doubt know I will be. So I do not have a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. We are facing and have been facing significant challenges in the education budget over the last three years. And as a result of policies from elsewhere, and I, I refer to Westminster, we face significant further pressures on our education budget moving forward. But we are going to develop the strategy. I will, I'm engaging with my officials over the coming weeks in terms as to how we fund the various programmes of work that exist within my department and what other programmes of work we can invest in going into the future. And I can assure the member that I will have close regard to the fact that we are developing a new uh, teacher development programme which will require funding. I call Nelson McCausland. 
Um, the role of teachers and principals within the education system, we're uh, all very clear on it's important that they do a professional development. School governors also have a very important role to play in the running of a school and setting the ethos and so on and monitoring the, the, the work of the school. Um, is the minister satisfied with the current level of training provided to governors and will he ensure going forward uh, that there will be a review of that to make sure that it is adequate for uh, the needs of governors? And I speak as a, a former governor myself. Uh, the, the member is absolutely right, and boards of governors play a key role uh, in, in any school and are key to not only the professional development of teachers but also the development of, of pupils through educational achievement. I have set aside over the last number of years half a million pounds towards board of governor training. It is in place. I accept that, uh, as with many other factors, it, it could do with more money, but we are now moving forward with the training programmes for boards of governors which will take time to bed in, and once it has run for a period of a number of years, then I think, yes, we should review it uh, as we move forward, but I do think we have made a good start. I call Cahill Boylan. Margaret, I'll ask Han Corley and could I thank the Minister for his answers, but could the Minister provide some details on the strategy for the Teacher Development Programme? Gora Mil Margaret. Um, well, uh, as I say, my officials are, are currently engaging with, with stakeholders and others in relation as to how we bring this development programme teacher development program forward. Um, obviously, lessons will be learned from CAS, lessons will be learned from the regional training unit and from the and professionals themselves as to how we ensure that continuous professional development is built upon and the needs and training needs and development needs of our teacher workforce uh, is brought to the floor. I call Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. How does the Minister seek to reduce the teachers' workload sufficiently to ensure that professional development is uh, genuinely accessible? Um, well, I have no wish to add further burden to teachers in, in their delivery of education into our, our schools, but any parent here will be aware that there is teacher training days uh, when pupils are not at school as any parent will know, and when the teachers are away at training courses. So we do provide uh, time off from teaching to, for teachers to go into training practices. So that, that is some of the pressure uh, alleviated of uh, the work commitments of teachers. Moving on, I call Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number five. I recognise the importance of access to support for speech, language and communication for those children in preschool and primary school that required as part of their special educational needs provision. Responsibility for arranging therapy of whatever nature when this forms part of the same provision in a child's statement falls to the Education and Library Boards, whereas prime responsibility for providing the therapy rests with the Health and Social Care Board and Trust as the employer of therapists. The Public Health Agency is conducting a review of the current level of allied health professional services and support, including speech and language therapy for children with statements of same. My department and the ELBs are engaging with PHA in this process. The ultimate aim of their review is to agree a proposed regional model to best meet the needs of these children. Early intervention is particularly important, and since 2001, ELBs have received over £14 million, almost £1.7 million, of which in 2014-15, additional funding for early intervention at key stage one for speech, language and communication needs. I recently announced an additional funding of £200,000 for eligible voluntary private school settings to help them identify and address underdeveloped social, emotional, communication and language skills. Speech, language and communication support is also a core element of each of the 39 Sure Start projects, with the Department investing approximately £1.1 million per annum in this specific provision. In addition, the recently completed three-year pilot in DE-funded early years uh, settings included speech and language therapists working as advisors in some pilot settings across the ELBs. I thank the Minister for his uh, detailed uh, answer and the review. If ever there was a, a, a key building block in terms of education, it is bound to be uh, speech and language. And, but given that up to 30 per cent of pre uh, school children are presenting themselves with language acquisition problems. Is there any immediate remedial action being taken by the Department in conjunction with Health uh, to address this ever-increasing problem? Well, uh, as the member stated himself, I have given a quite detailed answer on the services and support 
which are available uh, from my department and others in relation to speech and language therapy. We have carried out a quite extensive pilot scheme uh, in preschool providers, uh, and that work is currently being analysed uh, just to find out what points on it worked, what other points they developed, and if the overall approach is the way forward for our education system. I have provided further funding to allow those schemes to continue into the start of the next financial year while, that, uh, while we analyse the work that, uh, which has already been conducted. So we await the outcome of that report and I will work on the actions, action points of, of the report and will match it against whatever available funding I have at the time. Uh, members, I'm picking up uh, background noise. I don't know if it's in the chamber or outside the chamber, but would everyone ensure that uh, uh, mobile phones, etc., are, are turned off? Um, okay, back to question time. Okay, I call Michelle McElveen. Question six, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, the independent panel conducting the review of school transport presented their report to me at the end of August. I'm now taking time to consider the report and its recommendations before deciding on the way forward. The report will be published in due course. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And in light of the concerns being expressed within area learning communities about the cost of transporting pupils between schools in support of the entitlement framework, could I ask the Minister if he's giving any consideration to extending the use of bus passes? Um, around um, the, the concept of really being able to use it during the school day? Um, th that element and many, many other elements of school transport provision have been analysed by the authors of the report and I'm taking them all into consideration. Uh, obviously all these factors have cost consequences and, while, and they will have to be decided on as part of my deliberations around the report. Any changes to school transport uh, I propose as a result of this report will also have to go out to public consultation for the public uh, and others to have their say upon as well before any final decisions are made. I call Raymond McCartney. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer. He has outlined that there is going to be some form of public consultation. Could the Minister perhaps give some insight to what sort of consultation he would like to see happening and in, in, in involved in this issue? Uh, thank you, Mr. for his question. Well, firstly, we, I, I am studying the report, and it is quite a detailed report uh, with, with recommendations contained within. I will decide. I have to make a decision on basis where we put the full report out to consultation. I am going to publish the full report at the end, but will we put elements of the recommendations out to full consultation, which I believe are workable and feasible going into the future, or put the full report out to consultation and await the views of the public and others in regards to that matter. Uh, and th those are form part of my deliberations. It is worth noting that school transport costs approximately £75 million pounds a year. A significant proportion of that is in relation to special educational needs. Uh, and I'd, not suggesting in any way I want to tamper or touch with the special educational needs uh, transport section. But there is quite a significant amount of money spent on our transport system. We as a society are going to have difficult questions in the months and years ahead as to how we spend our reducing public resources on public services. Uh, and I have no doubt that if and when I go out to public consultation, there will be a quite a healthy debate uh, at times around the way forward for school transport. I call Danny Kinnan. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. May I thank the Minister um, for his answer so far. When looking at those transport costs, is the study looking at those children that travel maybe 15, 20 miles so that they can do A-levels somewhere else? I know for sure in Antrim that there are many that have to travel a long distance because there isn't the provision at post-16. Uh, thank you, Member, for his question. There, it, the report is quite comprehensive, and the authors of the report in fairness them have been very diligent in their work and spoke to many, many stakeholders within the transport system, especially young people, and I have been impressed by their engagement with young people in relation to their findings and observations or, uh, in regards to the report. So all those factors are taken into account and no doubt will be raised many, many times during the consultation period. I call Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister 
Uh, you know, there are two key points I think that he has already referred to. One is uh, the budgetary implications, but there, is, there are proposals for closure of some rural schools and also a proposed closure for one uh, Drum Creek College within his own constituency, which will inevitably lead to increased uh, transport costs. How does the Minister propose to deal with that uh, in relation to his uh, management of his budget and, and uh, whether or not he will take into consideration a cost-benefit analysis uh, with uh, CCMS and others as part of uh, the business case for retaining uh, some of our local schools? Uh, all such factors will be taken into account when making a decision in regards to any school, whether it's in my constituency or it is not. Uh, so, uh, there's, uh, to the best of my knowledge, there has been no development proposal published yet in relation to Drum Creek College. If one is published, there will be a two-month public consultation process where the member or others and others can uh, provide the department with any information they believe to be relevant to the decision-making process. I call Mike Nesbitt. Question 7. The Performance and Efficiency Delivery Unit, PEGI, produced a report in two stages. The first stage was a scoping study examining a number of areas with potential for realising efficiencies. The second, stage, the second stage involved a detailed examination of two selected areas, namely home to school transport and school catering services. There is a link between some of the potential efficiencies identified within these reports and the reporting of savings achieved in my department's published savings delivery plan. This will include areas such as professional support for schools, administration and management costs in the department's arm's length bodies and procurement. The recommendations made by PEGI in respect of home to school transport and school catering services were initially used to develop a series of actions. Many of these were referenced to the planned establishment of the Education and Skills Authority with efficiencies to be, re to be realised through the redesign of services. Now that the Executive has agreed that legislation should be brought forward to create a single body to replace the existing five education and library boards, this new Education Authority will be able to take on board the PEGI reports and decide what, if any, action they wish to take in regard to the recommendations made. I call Mike Nesbitt. Uh, thank the Minister. Uh, the PEGI also highlighted potential efficiency savings in administration, pointing out CCMS had seen a 51.7% increase in its staff with costs rising from 1.7 million in financial year 2003 to 2.9 in 2009-10. Uh, have, over the last three years, has the Minister been able to rein in these costs? Um, that's a reflection of the growing responsibility of CCMS, but it's also worth noting that if we had achieved ESA, then that would also have taken into account the running costs of CCMS and many, many other bodies. So, we can pick out individual sections of reports which suit our argument at the time, but if we do not follow through the decision-making process, i.e. in taking the hard decisions around restructuring, then I have to say that there is no point in wishing for savings. Savings can be achieved and should be achieved through the new Education Authority. There is now an opportunity. We are we're very, very close to agreement on the new Education Authority, which, in my opinion, can deliver savings, which can, can also therefore be delivered to frontline services. The two PAGI reports I put on hold, I have to say, uh, concentrated on school meals, which is affecting the lives, work and opportunities of some of the most lower paid workers within our education system and also in terms of school transport. School transport I have dealt with through the transport review and we are bringing the matter further. Uh, I was of the view that while there was political deadlock over ESA as to why we would affect the lives of the lowest paid in our education system did not make sense to me. I call Samuel Gardner. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question number eight. Uh, in preparation for ESA, uh, significant progress was made in planning the delivery of services on a consistent regional basis. This work will now support the creation of the Education Authority. Include, included the development of common procedures, policies for single organisation. A significant part of the money spent on ESA will therefore support the delivery of the Education Authority and allow it to move forward more rapidly once established. However, it is not possible to quantify the proportion uh, of monies which will be able to be utilised under the Education Authority. And that is the end of our time for listed questions, and we now move on to topical questions. Question number seven has been withdrawn, and I now call Ian Milne. Uh, 
Could I ask the Minister uh, if the recent actions by a D our UUP councillor in Antrim uh, to exclude him from a school's prize night uh, are the actions of a fit for purpose governor of an integrated school? Well, firstly, can I put on record that, in my opinion, the actions of the individual in no way reflect upon Park Hall School Integrated College. Uh, I have had the privilege of meeting members of the Boards of Governors of Park Hall before, along with a cross an all party delegation of political representatives from the town who were seeking a new build for the college. And I find them to be courteous, respectful, and seeking to live up to the principles of integrated education. I do not find the actions of the individual um, are in accordance with the principles or the ethos of integrated education. And in my humble opinion, he's not fit to be a governor of an integrated college. I call Ian Milne for supplementary. In light of your answer, what training or support is available to Board of Governors um, so that they may act in a positive influence upon a school uh, community? Um, in response to, I think it was Mr. McCausland, and, and during uh, oral questions, I refer to the fact that my department has set aside half a million pounds a year to facilitate training in regards to boards of governors and their roles and responsibilities in managing uh, a school. Um, and we are beginning, I believe, to see positive results as a part of that investment. I'm not sure um, if I had an endless amount of money if it would make any differences to the attitude of the individual involved, but we can only hope. I call Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, does the Minister acknowledge that there is a gap in integrated education provision for children aged uh, between 3 and 11 in the Greater Ards area? If there is a gap in provision in the Greater Ards area for children between 3 and 11, then what was required is a development proposal uh, brought forward by the relevant sponsoring body and through the relevant education board uh, or the, the authority in the future. Uh, so then we will decide through the normal processes of development proposals, analysing the evidence available, listening to interested parties in the area as to whether there is a gap in integrated education or not. Call Kieran McCarthy. I uh, thank the Minister for his response. But would the Minister agree with me that the transformation of, say, the Lockeries Primary School outside of Newton Ards would extend integrated prov provision and therefore accommodate? parental choice in the Greater Newton Ards area? Um, I think the member knows fine well that I cannot express an opinion on a development proposal that has not yet been published or which one of which, which may be published in the future. If the member believes that, it's up to him to convince the relevant authorities to bring forward a development proposal and then I will take on board all evidence presented to me during that development proposal process before I come to an opinion on it. I will not be calling the member listed to ask topical question number three, so then I call John um, McAllister. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, the Minister will be aware in order to meet uh, the needs of a modern economy and, and indeed our, our responsibilities around parental choice, it's argued that um, our education system uh, and our economy both need to be flexible and re responsive, and, and schools in providing education to meet the needs of the, the economy. Does the Minister believe that we have enough flexibility in our education system to meet the needs of a 21st century economy? Uh, I, I do believe we have the flexibility. Now, I think what we need to is ensure that we use that flexibility to the best of its ability uh, and ensure that there is a greater coordination between business and schools uh, going into the future. And I regularly engage with the business sector in regard, and as they do with me, uh, I'm furnished to them, they're very proactive in relation to this matter, in relation to the role of education under my remit and the economy and the needs of their businesses. I, so that engagement is ongoing, and I encourage them to become involved at their schools at a local level and schools to become involved with local businesses as well. Minister Forry and I have also launched a, a review of career services and part of that career services has to also look at the relationship between schools and businesses within their community and the understanding of teachers, parents and pupils of the needs of the economy as we move forward and the range of new careers that have developed over this last 10 years and the careers that are yet to develop in the next 10 years uh, to ensure that 
the educational pathways chosen by young people allow them to be flexible and in in, in adaptable to the new economy which is developing all the time. I call Joe McAllister. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I'm grateful uh, to the Minister for that reply. Uh, he will know in the draft budget that he's um, going to lose significant or scheduled to lose a significant proportion of, of money. Um, does the Minister have any ideological opposition to English-style academies in Northern Ireland, which, you know, in, in addition to what is his, his earlier reply, that could receive support both either financially or in kind from personal donors or from corporate sponsors? Has he any uh, objection to that? Well, my ideological opposition is not based on the fact that they're English. Let's start there, OK? Uh, my ideological opposition to them is the fact that they are a further level of exclusive schools rather than inclusive schools. And we have enough schools which exclude pupils in this society without creating another brand uh, to exclude young people. Our curriculum allows all our schools to engage with and be proactive with the business sector uh, and the economy. So let, let's develop that instead of going off into uh, academies as has been provided in parts of England, which have to say have also very, very mixed reports on their performances as well. Tom Elliott is not in his place. I call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I take the opportunity to ask the Minister for an, an update on the Three Hollywood Schools project? I'm sure he's very familiar with it. And give us some indication as to when there's a possibility of a new build for at least one of the schools, namely Hollywood Nursery, Priory College or Hollywood Primary Schools? Well, I am aware of the, of the case and, and the member has raised it with me repeatedly. Uh, there's a number of things that have to take place before we move forward towards uh, construction or start of construction or announcement of construction in relation to uh, the Hollywood Schools. A definition and uh, our a realisation that Priory College is a sustainable school moving forward. That is now boxes ticked. That's accepted. So this, uh, uh, and I've always said it's not a case of whether they need a new build or not, they do need a new build. So the next phase we have to go to is I have to identify the capital, the money to build new schools. I have used the limited resources available to me thus far. I'm facing a £50 million cut to my capital budget next year. And while I accept that there is very, very tight constraints upon all departments, I will be concentrating on that with the, the finance minister in the weeks ahead to see if, we can, if there is any flexibility around the capital budget to allow me to invest in schools, more schools moving forward. When and if, when I finalise my capital budget, I will be making a further announcement about a new school build programme going into the future. And it won't be until that stage will I be able to decide as to whether the three schools uh, in Hollywood will be on that list, either all three or one of them, to move the project on. I call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his comments. And would the Minister uh, recognise the need for capital investment? I suppose you partially answered that. But the, the real need for, for a capital investment in the town of Hollywood, where we have three schools all over 50 years of age, in poor condition, and, and we urgently need capital investment. I do recognise the need for capital investment in the Hollywood area. Uh, and as I said, um, the first part of that process was identifying and, and agreeing that Priory College was a sustainable school. It is a sustainable school and we, we need to provide it with new accommodation. That has a ripple effect uh, on the other schools uh, moving forward. So, as I've said to the member, and I don't wish to sound repetitive or raise the issue just for the sake of raising it, my capital budget next year faces a significant challenge. I am going to engage with the Finance Minister in relation to that matter to see how or what options we have to increase that capital budget or is there other funding mechanisms we can use in relation to the school's estate. Once I know the final outcome of those discussions, I will then make a decision on what, if any, new schools I can build in the foreseeable future, which I, have not have, which I haven't already announced. I call Paul Gervin. Thank you. Minister, I would just like a, a progress update in relation to the Park Hall School and the rebuild programme uh, for that school and how that's, that's progressing? Um, I, I, I don't have the full details in front of me, but it is progressing. 
uh, there has been engagement between the relevant authorities and uh, my department in relation to moving forward through the various stages of design, etc., around the school. But I would provide the member with a full written answer in regards to that matter to give him an update as to where the building programme for Park Hall rests. Nicole Cole Thank you. Uh, just the, reason, the reason I bring it forward is uh, that there is concern about some of the monies and ensuring that the money has been ring-fenced for that project and under the current uh, pressures that it is not going to disappear uh, into the black hole that seems to exist within the Department of Education. <laughs> I, I ignore that last remark. So, um, the, I, as I say, we are dealing with constrained financial times, and it's been well rehearsed in the House yesterday as to why we're there, or why we're here in this position. I have to make decisions in the weeks ahead about both my capital budget and my resource budget. But I am of the view that uh, I have eight weeks to negotiate and hurry the finance minister and other ministers, and I intend to use that time very, very usefully uh, moving forward. So there's no final decisions made about anything yet. Uh, Park Hall is working its way through the process to start commencement for a new build, and I'll give the member a written update on it. Barry Michael Duff is not in his place. I call Mickey Brady. Colonel Egott, uh, Lars Concordia. Can I ask the Minister for an update on the proposed new bill for St Joseph's Cross McLean? Um, St Joseph's Cross McLean is at the very, very early stages of the new build programme. I announced it in June of this year, if my memory serves me correctly. Uh, so it is at the early stages of uh, development. My departmental officials will be engaging with the relevant authority in moving that project forward. I call Mickey Brady. I thank the Minister for his answer. Does the Minister face any um, financial issues arising from the current economic crisis that may uh, halt or delay the, that particular project? Well, uh, as I have outlined repeatedly during this question time, I, along with other departments, do face significant financial pressures moving into the 15-16 financial year. I am not in a position to answer the member's question either affirmatively affirmatively or negatively. I am still engaged with my own officials around my budget. I will be engaging with the Finance Minister and other Ministers in regards to the draft budget and progressing our way through the next eight weeks. I am discussing, with, particularly with the Finance Minister, a range of announcements that were made as part of the budget, the budget speech here yesterday to see if there is other ways of funding school building programmes going into the future. So, I have a number of options I wish to explore. Members, the next period of questions is not due to commence until uh, 2.45, so I would ask you to take your ease for a few minutes.